Thanks for staying with us right here on Sunrise as we continue this morning. So you've overspent your December bonus and probably most of your salary during the festive season. And now it's January, probably the longest month in the year. And you're faced with a bit of a problem. You are cash stripped. Well, for most of us, that's usually the case. And we forget that uh, we still have bills to pay in January. Petrol costs and uh, to cover. And of course, phones and uh, phones need data. Then the everyday necessities. So the easiest thing to do is borrow money from a loan shark or even banks and even family members. Well, not to fear though. Uh, the credit ombudsman, Nikki Lala Mohan, joins us this morning to guide us through some of the credit issues we might be facing in January as well as, uh, uh, of course, uh, throughout the year. And to explain what the right way is to lend money if you have to. Remember, you can be part of our conversation by giving us a call on 11 or 11 Your comments are welcome on our Facebook as well as our Twitter pages. Good morning to you, Sam. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Penny, and morning to the viewers. <coughs> Let's uh, just start by explaining what reckless lending is. Reckless lending is where a credit provider gives you credit knowingly that you'll be unable to afford the installment. So in South Africa, before credit is granted to anybody, you've got to do an affordability assessment mm. to see whether that person qualifies for the loan that they're asking for. More importantly, whether from what they give you in terms of their expenditure, do they have enough money at the end of the month to service that debt in terms of its installment? Mm. If you knowingly know that this person will not be able to repay that debt, mm. that is reckless lending. And that has consequences because if the National uh, Tribunal finds you uh, guilty of reckless lending, it means that you're given that loan for free. You have no right to claim that loan and you can be charged and so you can be to fined the to, the to the lender. Okay. But then there's also the converse and that's reckless borrowing. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going to. Reckless borrowing is borrowing for things that we don't need. Um, borrowing things that lovely shades or sneakers or whatever, we don't really need it, but we know that we can't afford it, but we continue to go and borrow. We may not borrow from the mainstream institutions because we, we, we will fail to get the credit. So we borrow from friends and we borrow from Mashonisas and we borrow from other people. I mean, roughly do we know, do we have a sort of like stats and numbers on how South Africans are prone to doing such? We, one of the most, unfortunately, the most over-indebted countries in the world. Mm. Uh, South Africa has the highest rate of over-indebtedness. We have about 22 million active consumers, of which 14 million have adverse credit records. It means they haven't paid three installments um, at any given time. Mm. 14 million. Mm. Um, the exact numbers as to the number of underground lenders or whatever, we, re we really don't know, but we think it's a very big industry. Um, it's a billion rand industry. Uh, obviously, we don't know because they don't come to surface. Because if they do come to surface, then they'll be prosecuted. Mm. But it happens, and it's very big. It's a very big underground lending environment. But now, I is there a process that one can follow to prove uh, that a credit provider lended the money recklessly? Yes, there is a process. And mostly that process unfolds when you're unable to meet the payments that you're required to do. Mm. Then you go to a debt counselor or debt mediator. And the debt mediator looks at all the accounts that you have. And oftentimes they pick up, but there's reckless lending here. Mm. How did you manage to get these loans? And when there's reckless lending, the debt counselor engages with the credit provider. Sometimes the credit provider won't admit reckless lending because there are consequences to it. But it can go to a court, it can go to the National Credit Regulator, ultimately to the National Consumer Tribunal that will find an agreement reckless. Okay, so we've got some comments uh, from our viewers this morning and uh, we asked them looking at getting your finances back in order and uh, of course, do you have any questions about lending money? And then uh, we've got uh, Felix saying, it is allowed to borrow, f is it allowed uh, to borrow from a bank using someone else's credit profile uh, or seeding someone else's insurance to borrow a loan if you can pay the installment of the loan on their profile? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Your credit profile is your property. It's your 
identity, it's your credit identity. Um, and it's the contracting parties that get into the contract with each other. So if you want to borrow on my behalf, you actually affecting my credit profile. Mm. But nobody will give you uh, credit on that basis, knowingly that you're borrowing for somebody else. There's something else called a surety and that kind of stuff, but mm. it's more in relation to property and cars, etc. where knowingly you stand guarantee mm. that in the event of uh, me default, failing to pay, yeah. you must step in. But no, you can't do that, unfortunately. All right, let's take uh, Nazim saying, w what are the consequences of borrowing money at this time of the year in the bank or loan sharks? I think there's two parts to the question. If you go to the bank, you're going to a, a proper institution. Uh, the, the interest rate that you'll be granted is regulated. It's a legal interest rate. If you can afford to do so, if you can afford to do the pay, repay the installment, go ahead, but make sure that you're borrowing for a good cause. Mm. Don't borrow from Peter to pay Paul. But the loan sharks now, loan sharks charge interest exorbitant. They charge, like if you take 100 Rand, they want 200 Rand next week. That's 100% mm. interest for a week. Mm. Problem is that if you don't pay, they'll come and beat you up. That's the problem with loan sharks. Mm. There's violence. Uh, there's intimidation, and 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 uh, my advice is never go to a loan shark. Right. Let's uh, take Tidi Solibona saying, it, uh, "Is it good to lend a friend some bucks? Expect them to bring it later. <laughs> this is a very month end." <laughs> if you have a trusted friend, that will give you the money. Yes, <laughs> but you know, borrowing from friends <laughs> in, and lending to friends is like a free gift. You know, we just <laughs> so there's a never, never borrow, never borrow money to your friends. <laughs> just give it to them. Just give it to or them. Or family Absolutely. members. Yeah, eh? Don't give it to them. <laughs> you'll have you'll have a riot in the family. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well there you have it. Okay, um, how should consumers be tackling their debt uh, for a repayment from a repayment point of view? If at this point of the year you start and you're looking at your finances and you're unable to meet uh, your monthly obligations, the best thing to do is to get in touch with the credit provider. Tell them that I'm supposed to pay you a thousand rand at the end of the month. Unfortunately, I can't pay you a thousand rand. Can I pay you 500 rand? Mm, mm. They will agree to it, but there's consequences. It has a negative effect on your credit profile. The term that you're going to repay the loan will be longer, so it'll cost you more to pay off that loan in the, in the long term than in the short term. Okay. So Garth has got a question as well. If someone has used your name uh, to buy stuff that you don't know about, what can one do? That is very common. It's identity theft. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. And because we are quite reckless with our identities, especially household bills, IDs, if somebody gets your identity, they duplicate it, and they act as if they're you. But if you point that out to them that it wasn't me, um, they will reverse the transaction, but it's identity fraud. Mm. And uh, there is an organization called the South African Fraud Prevention Services. Mm. Your name will be placed on their bureau, on their list. So every time a, an application for credit is made, there'll be a lookup to see and you will be declined because it's known that mm -hmm. your ID has been stolen and somebody's using it illegally. Okay, okay where and how can consumers uh, get credit assessments? Credit assessments is in, um, well I'm not sure what they mean by credit assessment. There's different points of credit assessment. Mm. Credit assessment is do you qualify for the credit? But more importantly, I think what they're trying to say is that I'm in trouble, help me. Mm. So you can go to a debt mediator, you can go to a debt counselor, uh, you can even approach the credit provider. The best thing to do is always first approach the credit provider mm. so that they're aware of your circumstance. Running away from a credit provider doesn't help because then that's when they pursue legal action against you. And ultimately, if you have issues relating to your credit information profile or where you believe that you've been charged the wrong interest, you can come to our office, the Credit Ombud. We will assist you. Um, we have a free SMS line. All you have to do is drop us an SMS, double four seven eight six. We call you back and we'll deal with your matter. Double four seven, seven eight, eight six. six. Okay, so are things like debt consolidation and debt review assisting people in the long run? One has to be very careful. Debt consolidation, depending what it means, is that you take all your debt, you put it together, mm. and you pay one sum. But you're paying a higher sum, you're paying over a longer period of time, mm. and until you pay that off, you're out of the credit market. So it has 
consequences. Uh, debt counseling has effects, uh, positive effects. If you do it properly, you go through a proper debt counselor, you meet your obligation. Problem with South African debt counseling, we get into the debt counseling, but halfway through we break the agreement and we're back to square one. We don't keep up with all the arrangements that we're supposed to do. And we're finding more and more of that in terms of debt counseling. When debt counseling, when the act came into being in 2008, it was the biggest industry that mm. started. There were some two, 3,000 debt counselors. Today, there are about 300 left. Mm. It's not as lucrative as it used to be. Um, and also, people are not abiding by the terms of their agreement.